At FindHomeBuilding.com, we've taken our 40 years of experience publishing an expert written magazine for architects, designers, builders, remodelers, and do-it-yourselfers, and used it to build the best online membership available to anyone interested in high-quality, high-performance homes. With an all-access membership, you can read 40 years of FHB print issues, watch hundreds of in-depth how-to videos, follow the annual FHB house build, plan your next project with our new project guides, and much more. Visit finehomebuilding.com to sign up for all access, the most important tool in your toolbox. Hey, Fine Home Building podcast listeners. The podcast you're about to hear was recorded live at this year's Midwest Building Science Symposium. We didn't have video capability at the show, so I apologize to those of you who like the video version of the podcast. But the good news is, we turned the tables and asked the live audience questions and got some great responses. Enjoy the show and thanks for listening. I have to be scared that I don't have any drying. But now I also have to be scared that I'm letting all this vapor through into my my roof system. Like, how does the OSB know to let the vapor through in the place <laughs> that it hurts me? And it's, well, just, it's very it's confusing. Well, that's so expensive, Travis. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. We're recording live from the 2021 Midwest Building Science Symposium. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. I'm joined by FineHomeBuilding.com Editor Rob Wadsack. Hey, everybody. Travis Brungard of Catalyst Construction. Hello. Please email your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Well, I can tell you it is a special honor to be with you all today. Thank you very much for coming and learning more about the important work we do. Travis, can you start off by telling us a little bit about how the Building Science Symposium in the Midwest got started? I'd be happy to. Uh, it's actually kind of tied back to a fine home building story. So my partner, Joe Cook, and I, who run Catalyst Construction, we were uh, fortunate to attend the Fine Home Building Summit in Southbridge, and it was a pretty formative experience for us. We haven't done trade shows before in, in terms of IBS or the JLC Live. We've never been to one of those. Uh, but I saw the lineup you guys put together for that, and I, I called Joe that night. I was like, man, we got to buy tickets tonight. It's going to sell out. we got to buy tickets tonight. I just heard about this. And we went, and it was amazing. It was a fantastic event. It was a Mount Rushmore speakers. There was no stone unturned. Um, of course, you left with more questions than answers because the more you learn, the more you learn you need to learn. Uh, so we came back to that, we came back from that, and we had already established with Joe Nichols of Thrive Building Solutions, our local KC BS and Beer. So we have a BS and Beer group that meets monthly to discuss building science, just building in the Midwest in general. It's kind of a builder support group. Uh, designers and architects are regular attenders. So we have a, a really good core of people already. And when we got back, we were like, you guys, I, I know we told you you should all come with us and you didn't come. I'm telling you, you missed out. We've got to do something like this here. They're not going to bring it to us. We got to bring it. So we started talking to some industry friends. We were buddies with Jake in Columbia, Jake Bruton in Columbia. Uh, and of course, through him, through Steve Basic, we talked to those guys about, hey, would you guys be willing to uh, maybe come and speak in Kansas City? getting a little smaller crowd maybe, but it's cheap to get here. It's centrally located. We're going to draw from a lot of places just by virtue of the fact that it's cheap and easy to get here. And you haven't had, uh, you hadn't had anything like that. No, no, no one comes here to do uh, building expos on the level of that. Certainly not building science. you said in science. the past that uh, building science in this part of the country can be a hard sell. What made you think that you could attract uh, a group of builders and remodelers and designers to this event? Uh, it was purely the, the support of our local BS and beer attendees. Like we started our first meeting, we had 89 people in attendance. Uh, grand How many? 89? 89. That's we, impressive. We bought the beer. So, you know, free <laughs> beer will draw out a lot of attendees. You got to be wary of here. <laughs> yeah, but that, I mean, c considering that the original BS and beer meetings were just a handful of guys up in a lumber yard up in, in Maine, uh, that's pretty impressive for your first meeting. Yeah, agreed. It was great, but we were afraid that it was just the beer. So then we bought the beer for the second meeting. And we told him, this is the last time we're buying everybody's beer. 
And we still had over 30 for, I think, the third meeting. And we'll have, we average 17 to 25 for most of our monthly meetings. But it was the support of that group and the regular attendance and the people seeing new faces every time at those meetings that we were like, no, this is a real thing. This is going to have legs. We'll, Joe and I were thinking, oh, you know, we'll sell tickets to this. We'll be able to send money into the building trades. We can funnel money into our local school district and really get the trades programs reignited that are kind of falling off. And uh, I talked to Jake about it a little bit, and he's like, you really should talk to Tracy at Huber because they run all these programs. They run Building Science Crossroads. They do this all over. I mean, you guys are you're great guys, but you're not going to nail it. We're not first Huber, time. let's be honest. <laughs> well, as far as running events, yeah. you know what I mean? It wasn't something... I'm a terrible host. I don't have that in my blood, but there's people that do run trade shows and do a, a good job at it. And so their job just... is to train folks on their products. So they have a leg up on this kind of, uh, you know, get together where folks are learning about their craft. Exactly. So we followed the advice of people who knew and we got involved uh, with Huber. They decided they would actually help us run it so that it could be a ticketless event, a free, a free to attend event. And that was last year's event. Jake Bruton and Steve Basic came to this brewery and spoke for a day teaching anyone who wanted to hear uh, about best practices in building science. It was a very successful event. Uh, right at the height of the pandemic, we were still able to keep everyone safe. There were no new cases as a result of the event, and we had almost 100 in attendance. So building on that success this year, I mean, I was really pushing for a four-day event. We got a two-day event out of it that had, again, Jake and Steve were back with new new things to share, of course, like they always do. But we also had Peter Yost who came out with Randy Williams. Those guys so next when level. you were talking about the the fine home building summits uh rock star uh lineup of speakers you guys have virtually uh the same lineup right it's, well we're trying yeah, yeah. <laughs> we got we got maybe half of them you know there's room for improvement but we had all that we could handle for two days i'm i think uh with with the crew that we had in with ben bogey kicking things off he basically he gave us a look back through through history like how did we get to where we are in building it was it was impressive. I mean, the amount of research he had to do, I, I'm not super sharp. So I asked him to send me the notes after, uh, and he said he would do that cause he's a good guy, but basically to have that whole experience, uh, with, with Mike Gurton today, you know what a rock star Mark, Mike Gurton is in my world. I, mean, I still feel I get a little uh, inadequate when I even talk to Mike Gurton. So yeah, I totally know what you're talking about. So that's, that's what we ended up with was, uh, this year's event is a two day event. Uh, we're wrapping up the the coattails of it now with the Keep Craft Alive event. And we actually are doing some big things to raise funds. So it, this is a dream come true for us. And that's, that's kind of how it all came together. That was the why. And here's the how, you know, the one thing I heard talked about a lot yesterday that, uh, got my, uh, mind working was like expressing the value of, uh, building science and high performance and good building to clients, you know, who may be resistant to, spending more money than they think they have to. How do you, and I'm going to ask all of you after I talk to Travis about this, how do you express the, the value of doing the extra step, going a little beyond to give them a better house? How do you convince them that that is a worthwhile pursuit? Boy, that's tough. I don't know that I'm the person to say that. I mean, we've been trying for a long time and there are some clients that are receptive to it and some that really don't care. Uh, they, they want their square footage. They want their nice finishes and the performance is very much secondary and sometimes even further down the line for some of our clients. But what we've found is that if you establish your integrity and your value with someone and you tell them it's important, it, it gains value in their eyes. And if you're, if you're reputable and you've, you've carried yourself in a way where you can point to your past projects and, and they can talk to your past clients and be like, you know, what do you like about your ass? Cause we're thinking about hiring these guys. I'm not so sure they keep talking about our value and air leakage. And I want to talk about my countertops. Are these guys any good at this? And your past clients say, yeah, yeah, yeah you're going to get your countertop, but the house is going to be so quiet and there's no dust. It's, it's, it's comfortable by the window. Like I can sit by the window and read, you know how nice it is to sit by the window and read and not have a draft. Those are the kinds of things that you get back, but you're at least here. Energy is pretty cheap. It's not a, it's not a driving force. Like I think it might be in the Northeast where people are going, Oh, you know, we really got to do something about this air leakage. Cause yeah, I can't, we can't spend afford $700. our $400 uh, gas bill. Right. Yeah. But, but here it's pretty inexpensive. And so that's, and we might have a slightly more mild winter, of course, uh, that has something to do with it too, but we have a real nasty humid summer to go with that mild winter sometimes too. So I don't know. I think your, your client is going to always be the challenge in any build as much as the, the plan might be difficult in one spot or another to, to land the project 
and to have the client care about what you care about has to all come together uh, early on. And there are a lot of jobs we don't get or don't take because that doesn't exist. Do any of you out there have any thoughts on how you get clients to uh, pay a little more for a better house? Anyone, please? Yeah, come on. Mariana. Hi. <laughs> um, so I talked about this a little bit earlier, and I, I actually have a mini, mini course on kind of how to pitch passive um, and how to sell high performance. But the idea, I think, comes down to understanding who you're talking to and finding empathy in figuring out what their problem is and solving that solution. Anybody that works in high performance for a really long time knows that it solves a lot of problems, right? It's It solves problems for the builder on the liability side. It solves problems as far as durability, resilience, a lot of health and comfort issues, but maybe not all of those matter to everyone. So the really big thing is figuring out who you're talking to and that's listening. And if you can listen to what their problem is, then you can kind of pivot into, well, this is a solution for this reason, you know. Mariana, what are the like common problems that you hear from potential clients that they're looking to solve? Well, I mean, part of the reason I say this is because we have different types of clients, right? So we, we work with builders. Sometimes actual building owners come to us, but typically we're working either with the builder, the architect, the manufacturer. And a builder, an architect, a manufacturer, a homeowner, they're all going to have different things that, that are typical problems, you know? Um, I would say from the homeowner side though, um, and, and building owner, larger building owners, developers, um, the health argument, the indoor air quality argument is always what, what sticks the most, whether that's um, really talking a lot about air quality or noise reduction or dust reduction, pest reduction, depending on where you are. Um, that's kind of the most effective selling point of high performance that I've seen with building owners. Um, when you're talking to project teams though, because you can't forget, you, you know, no matter what role you play in this, it's unlikely that you go into a high performance project and there's not someone on the team you have to convince, <laughs> unfortunately. Because <laughs> you know, they're skeptical, right? They, yeah. They're used to doing things a certain way and you need to yeah. get them on board, right? Right. Like one of the things you say is like a language. Everybody's got to speak that language. And, you know, the, it's growing the likelihood that you get a whole project team that speaks that language, which is great. But, you know, those of us who are kind of in the pioneer stage of that, like, will often come across folks that we have to work with that don't necessarily speak that language yet. So you do have to do some convincing. So sometimes that's your architect. Sometimes that's, you know, a supplier. It kind of depends. I think with architects, the biggest um, kind of selling point with designers and architects is that, if you are well-versed in the building science, it can actually remove some of the scope for them, allow them to really focus on design and beauty. Because you not, have the, the details yeah, that they yeah. don't have to worry about. Right, right. right. Whereas, and then with, with manufacturers, a lot of it is, you know, um, the research side of it and validation of, of that market and validation of kind of, uh, you know, we do a lot of uh, data gathering about how those things then work in the projects. I know a lot of the builders that were here at this event talked about, you know, gathering data from their projects after people are living in them. Mm. And that's valuable knowledge to manufacturers. So, sure. yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? Well, you know, one thing Jake Bruton was talking about in his talk was about uh, having an example to show people because it's like his own house and his, yeah, his case, own right? house in his case, it, because like, People don't know what the quality of a better house is if all they're used to is a, is an average house. We were talking to uh, Michael Ingwe, who's uh, an architect in uh, New York City, and the way he demonstrates to clients the uh, importance of his high-performance bills is he takes them to his own house, which is in New York City, and very loud, and he closes the doors and the window, and the house is silent, which, of course, you can imagine is a huge selling point for folks in a busy urban environment, right? That's like, you need to demonstrate the uh, what this is giving you, what, what the benefit is, right? Sure. It almost seems like we need to have like a building science amusement park where people get to go in and... Uh, go into the like, moldy room. Like lie, <laughs> lie down in the, in, the, in the room that has like freezing cold outside, and they can stand near the windows and... <laughs> That's perfect. That might be the best idea you've ever had. <laughs> so uh, how are we going to make this kind of nefarious uh, topic of building science more palatable to a wider audience? Like, as you were talking about and Mariana's talking about, like, 
folks don't know what they're getting when they're getting a high performance build. They're focused on countertops. They're focused on all kinds of aesthetic choices or, you know, design choices, but the house itself and its energy requirements are, are lower down the list. How do we make people care about this stuff? Do you have any thoughts on that? I do. I think passion's contagious. I think that if, uh, if I sit down at the table with clients to discuss their home and I say, yeah, that's a beautiful kitchen design. I'm really excited about the custom cabinets that we're going to put in there. Uh, the flow, the space is fantastic. And when you when you sit down in this room, you're going to be able to enjoy the light from those windows over there. And it's not going to be cold at all because this is the windows that we prefer. Mm -hmm. And if, I, if I'm very specific about kind of creating the feel that all of those high performance details, the benefits of that, you know, of course, for me, I talk a lot about my family. I've got young kids at home and Joe's the same way. He's got three of his own kids at home that we both do a good job of reminding our clients that we're very similar to many of our clients and that we both answer to a budget. Mm -hmm. These are not easy decisions to make. And it, it is harder to decide, well, you know, I really like to have some stone on the house, but if I put the windows in that are the right windows for the house that are going to be here for 25 to 50 years, I maybe can do that stone instead of repainting. 15, 20 years from now. Maybe we add the stone at a later time, but we don't have to destroy the building envelope because we're adding an aesthetic benefit later. And we'll talk about making those sorts of trade-offs, but I think the passion for um, high-performance building is contagious to our clients. I've seen it time and time again in a meeting uh, where you're sitting with folks and you're talking about, you know, this is our standard. We use a two by six wall frame, 24 inches on center. We like zip R on the outside to break the thermal conductivity from the studs to the exterior cladding. And we like to put Rockwell R23 in the cavities. And the reason we like Rockwell- Do they even know what you're that. talking about? No, but they get it because I don't let it go. <laughs> because I just keep bringing it up. Yeah. Because when we go from one step to the next step, we always are coming back to, yes, and that will work because we're going to air seal when we put down the sill plate. We're going to, we don't have to worry about that. We don't need to bring in a spray foam truck at $6,000 to spray your rim joist because we used a bead of Sashco sealant around and then stuck the gasket in and then did the framing. And then we can just put a piece of rock wool in the cavity and we've insulated because we've already solved for air. And they start thinking about, oh, you know, when I go downstairs to do laundry and I can see the cobwebs blowing in the wind and I think, oh, that spider's gonna get me. And I'm like, yeah, because they came in on the, the air that's making the cobweb blow, but we solved that just with this simple thing. And I show them the details and we talk about the way we do it. And we're so excited about it. They're either incredibly irritated by us or they're like, oh, these guys really care about my house. They really want to do a good job. Do any of you have any thoughts on how to uh, get your clients on board or make it more palatable so they understand what you're, heck you're talking about? Anyone? 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 Don't all rush the mic at once now. We got, Come we on. got, a, we got a guy. I don't want to riot, Brandon. Be calm. I'm not as eloquent as Travis. but so, Sorry, Brandon. Brandon uh, Jones. Yeah. What do you do, Brandon? You're a builder? Uh, builder, remodeler. Yeah. And how do you get clients to, uh, you know see the, the, the things you want to do as valuable and not frivolous or unnecessary. So part of it, we've made a standard. Some of it's not even a conversation because it's not an option for some of the things we do. You still educate them through the process, but it's some of the clients don't relate to the 25 things that you just went through and you lose them and they're gone. They're out, right? Yeah. So like, but I we think have to be able to talk to people who have no understanding, right? Sure. And I think it's a process though, too. So it may be, Jake said it's been seven years to mm. get there. So it, the next five conversations I haven't sit down with it, it may not go exactly how we think it should or the way it should be, right? But maybe year two, we get five out of seven to do it that way or they're whichever. But it's a process, just like in people in the trades or everything else we've talked about you know, the last two days. It's just going to be time. And it's going to be process and education and everybody here doing what they're doing to get it out there, I think. Thanks, man. Anyone else? You know, I want to say the exciting thing about that is that, uh, you know, we we launched Green Building Visor as a sister brand to Fine Home Building, what, about 12 years ago now? And when we launched that, we never would have imagined. I mean, we, we barely had people in the, like, deep green building market there. It was like a there. few hundred people, right? Yeah. yeah. And and now, and and one thing, you know, we, we, it was mentioned earlier, they're like, oh, were you, are you surprised that in, in, in the Midwest you're having, a you know, a, this many people come out? Well, I don't think... It, uh, 
after talking to a lot of people today, I don't think there is like a regional, I mean, certainly maybe in certain regions, there's more uh, density of, of people talking about this stuff. But I think it, the great thing is about like Instagram and other places on the internet, we we start discovering these little pockets of people in anywhere in the world. And that, that's, that's, I think, the really exciting thing. We need to not overlook that, that there are probably people in our own backyards that are thinking about this stuff and we just need to continue to connect with them. What were you going to say, sir? And who are you? Uh, Wes Edwards, uh, Maverick Handyman in Construction. Basically, I'm a remodeler handyman. Where do you work? Uh, Kansas City area, Raymore, Lee Summit area. So just south of here. Yep. Um, my thing is, is kind of following up on you. Like if you say, hey, we might have to hold off on this to have this, the outside benefit of that high ability, that high build quality that we're putting into this is the money they're saving on the mechanical side of things they're heating their or cooling energy. and everything and energy across the board that money can go towards doing those projects that they really wanted up front at a higher rate than say we're paying our mortgage we're still paying 300 dollars a month or 400 dollars a month on energy and now they have they can get to their overall goal at a quicker rate and uh, the other half that I was going to say, how I sell that high quality stuff is standards like he was saying. There are certain things that I won't do when I build, and there are certain things that I will absolutely do, and I don't budge on them. Uh, like do, you, if I'm, do you feel like you have to explain that stuff ahead of time, or is that I, explained I do as it explain comes it. Up? I mm -hmm. do explain it, and this is how I do explain it. Like when I build a deck, I will not build a deck without joist tape. Why? Because I want to protect their framing and their investment. 110 percent is to make it last as long as possible and i will put in there you know at this date we'll be ready for staining so that we can take care of your deck this is how much it's going to cost that way they have an idea because i want to protect that investment and it gives me another job to do on the back end and you're but, maintaining contact with your client which is always a good thing right i think you'd agree so the the key part to that though is, is why won't i do this and how do i sell it well when somebody's buying a house, they're looking at a long term, especially if they're buying a custom house for themselves. This is long term. So they want their money to last as long as possible to where they, they have least issues as, as possible to go with it. And with the climate that we have right now, with the material prices up, even if wood's going down, um, you know, material prices are high. So we need to make that investment last even longer for these people. Mm -hmm. We need that quality to be the best quality that we can put out there in the workmanship to be out there so that their their Protected. investment really wraps around it. And that's the main thing and the easiest thing to sell to a client. Yes, it's going to cost you $400 to put joist tape on your 12 by 12 deck, but your deck is now going to last X, Y, and Z. You know, you're going to get 20 years out of a wood frame deck versus 15 mm. or you know, especially if you're putting composite boards down on top of it, X, Y, you know, everything is a, a relating factor, but it's, it's easy to sell a client on maintaining an investment for the long term, especially when it comes to their comfort, their safety and, and, uh, we should their write overall that down, Rob. maintaining an investment, right? Cause that's, that's what it's all about. You're, you're spending a ton of money and you, you want this to last and be good and work, right? Working is everything. I think that's the foundation of of selling building science to clients. It's Thanks, all about man. durability. It really is. That's what it all comes back to for them because they're not really interested in. They in don't understand it, right? And, for yeah. the most part. And there's very few that would be interested in bragging to their friends about a low ACH on their blower door. But there are a ton of people that don't want to go paint. So if you start talking about how your rain screen extends your paint interval and you can easily look at the person at the table who's had to repaint their house. They're always easy to find because you start talking about paint and they're going, oh man, they're, they're like shifting that. back and forth. And the guy's going, oh man, 15 years, I don't know if I can make it. Uh, if you can tell them, look, I think that your paint job on your exterior lap siding is going to be a, a service inter interval extended by at least five to 10 years as a result of this additional drying and venting. All of a sudden, now they're invested. Now they want that rain screen. And now you can almost upsell that rain screen for even more than it would cost. And they would be happy to pay it because they just don't want to pay. Right, because they, they've had a bad 
situation, yeah. right? And to that's the sort of the, the foundation for all of this. But the the idea of uh, what Steve Basic was showing in his diagram yesterday with the dials, where you're turning one dial and it moves another thing, that's a budget thing too. If you if you if a client will let you in and we'll start talking about budget and understand, you know, if you've got a good rapport and there's trust. And you can say, well, you know, I think we could use a, a higher end window here and then we can reduce the size of your HVAC system as a result of the reduced load on your house. Then all of a sudden they're like, oh, OK, well, I, I like I like that we're not spending any more money and the house is better. And that's how Joe and I can't sell an ERV. We've been trying to sell ERVs for a long time and we just started selling them. And the only way that we can do it is we put in better R value insulation, better air sealing and better windows. And now we have a low load home. And we take the money that was going to go into that four and a half ton system yep. to blow all that air out of the house. Yep. And we throw it into a Panasonic unit in the basement. And, oh, we solved all these problems. Look how good we are. Well, that's the thing. Is that that's one of the big differences between these kinds of improvements or upgrades that you don't get in, in like the aesthetic upgrades. Like if you pay more for granite countertops... It's not like you're saving money somewhere else by doing that. But if you if you put a rain screen in or if you put better insulation in or better air sealing in, then that's going to – those systems that sound so expensive to, to the homeowners, it's like you, you almost shouldn't even talk about the cost of the systems because – the net gain is that you're able to put them in smaller systems in and have more and sh lower cost or longer dur longer term lifespans of materials. What were you going to say, sir? And who are you? I'm Mitch from Minneapolis. Um, builder, you're a builder remodeler. Builder Mitch? remodeler. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming um, down. You know, speaking to the rain screen, you know, the manufacturers are starting to. That's part of you know if they that's part of their directions. Nichi ha. Some of the new cladding, they're, they're, they send... Because they have, have an interest in it working, right? They, they want they their, si their products do. to work, right? And, and so that's cooked into doing that kind of cladding. But, and Randy could probably attest to this, in Minnesota, we have... It's real easy. It's, I mean, it's hard to explain the way you are to, you know, to a degree um, as far as, you know, 12, 12, 24 on center, you know, two by six walls, all that. But... If you speak to the to the homeowner and know what's important to them in in Minnesota, we can say, hey, you know how everything we're talking square footage, how every room, no one sits in, in that couch near that window. No, like you put in, we insulate these walls, we replace the windows. All of a sudden you gain square footage. You, you got your whole house instead of part of it, right? Honestly, you do. Yeah. And, and to tell you the truth, I can see the, the whistles go off above people's heads sometimes. So that works for me. Thanks. You know, I can speak to that from experience. I was talking to a few people today about how- You can speak to anything on any subject. Well, I can. <laughs> it's, yeah. But like, I've, I've got a house from 1871 and I've got this sunroom put on in the 1970s that has double pane windows that the gas seals have sa failed on them. And I can pretty much only use that room as, a, as an interior space like half of the year, right? And so I have a 2,800 square foot house, but half of the year when you count that and my attic and some other rooms that aren't you know part of my where my mini splits are it's like my house is essentially half the size usable space you know <laughs> it's a great way to look at it though if you could convince your clients. i got that. a great question for all of you okay and we'll start with travis but i hope all of you will uh, weigh in because it's going to inform what we do as a brand fine home building what is the biggest science head science building science head scratcher what confuses people the most? I would say currently vapor. I think there's so much talk around vapor and there's such a poor understanding of dew point as it relates to vapor that that, I mean, that's what still trips me up. I yeah. still make, I make weekly calls to people be like, should I be scared about this? <laughs> I've had hours of debates with Steve Basic and I don't know if you ever debated with Steve Basic. You're going to lose. I, I'm never. Right. I would never try it. Yeah. But you know. Well, I'm a fool, and I try to run <laughs> into the wall as often as I can until I pass out from uh, the content. So, what is it about vapor that's so nebulous? So we talk about it as if it's this really dangerous thing that's going to rot all of our houses out, and it can be, but it doesn't have to be if you take a couple of steps to mitigate it or deal with it appropriately. And that's where it gets super complex because we talk about like, oh, OSB, you know, it's low permeability. It's a two perm 
two to three maybe on a commodity product. Uh, you really can't trust any drying to move out of your wall system with an OSB skin on it. But we're talking about doing an overroof on a project that's coming up, and I'm really excited about it. It's a great project, great client, fantastic partners working on it uh, on the architectural design side. And I'm excited about putting five inches of comfort board on top of my zip roof deck. And I've had three people message me like, you got to have a much greater airspace. If you're using a two by six uh, over roof structure and you only have a half inch gap above your five inches of comfort board, you're going to rot that roof deck out because there, you're going to have all this vapor from the house. And Ben Bogey's been trying to coach me on how to not rot my client's house out with vapor. And I'm going, but wait a minute. How is it that I have to be scared that I'm not letting vapor out on the wall where it's two to three perms? I have to be scared that I don't have any drying. But now I also have to be scared that I'm letting all this vapor through into my my roof system. Like, how does the OSB know to let the vapor through in the place <laughs> that it hurts me? And it's, well, just, it's, it's very it's confusing. Well, that's so expensive, Travis, is because they're like they're uh, amping the uh, intellect of it, right? Well, that's yeah, like why. Like Patrick and I were talking about this, and we kind of guessed that that would be the first answer oh, yeah, that we, anybody we would give. Because we're hole. like, you know, yeah. no matter, it doesn't matter where you are. Would you all agree that vapor is the most uh, confusing thing? No? Go ahead. Mark <laughs> Willie coming to Come the on, microphone. Mark. Love to see it. So you said, Patrick, you said the biggest head scratcher for building science. Sure. We're in the presence of people that are into this, but the head scratcher isn't the people that are into this. Okay. The head scratcher is code is five ACH. Till we understand that the air is moving, we can't even get to the vapor. And we have the data that proves that track builders. So are you guys at five uh, ACH? Is that is In the city that we're sitting in right now, yeah. the local authority enforces five. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to clarify. Go ahead. Totally. And, yeah. and, and, and every region is different yeah. because we need to adapt things separately rather than collectively, which is ridiculous because we are collaborators. So I guess your point is that like vapor is a problem because we're letting a lot of air into the house. Is that correct? It's a bigger issue than it would be? I'm saying people aren't going to understand vapor the way Travis explained it until we back up and say the ACH at five is not what we're going for. Three is the threshold or two, right? Let's just put it there or one. Shoot Thanks, for Travis. one, Mark. Shoot for the stars, I read you, I, I read you right? And I track that. So we have the data. In the Midwest only, I believe, and you guys from Fine Home Building would know, but Rob would know. I, so there's the data from from Mia three or four years ago that the track builders were already building below three ACH. The data is already there. Just they, by their normal operations, is that their their, their craftsmanship is great. Huh. Their materials are great, and their dedication to do an acceptable job beyond right because you can't unsee what you've learned and that data proves it so why are we at 5 ach who said what but i'm hoping none of you are right because you have that choice you can decide how to build your homes and you can direct your clients help your clients to get the right thing uh, I guess your competition is the what I would worry about because they are not talking about this stuff, right? Yeah, and I always get kind of my skin starts to scroll, to crawl when I you start talking that about happen. competitors. Like reaction to we're really big on colleagues, not competitors. I believe that the track home builders in my market are colleagues of mine. Mm. We're we're all trying to build homes for people, and there are people at different price points. Um, I. When we start talking about code, I always think of Glenn Mathewson, who does, I think, the best job of relating code to people like me, uh, the builders. The practical enforcement is key for us. We don't want to argue with someone about the letter of the code. We want to understand the big, reason big behind pictures. it. Exactly. And Glenn's great at that. But I had a conversation with Glenn that didn't go so well because there was an interruption. And I was trying to explain to him, I think that there is an argument to be made that the process needs to be longer and the code needs to be stricter. So I just bought my first new car for myself last year and I'm 44. So I have made choices in my life that made it not sensible for me to purchase a new car. And frankly, a lot of people would say it's not really smart to buy a new car. 
you should buy a used car because you know it loses eight thousand dollars off the light. All of those things are true. But the reason that I brought it up to him was like, it took me all of this time driving my 2004 F-150, saving money and planning and trying to make a good decision and deciding what was right for me before I made that big purchase. I think that's what a house should be for people. So when we start talking about, God, we got to have affordable housing for people. Yes, we do. But that doesn't mean we should reduce the quality. It doesn't mean we should make the code less stringent so that we can make cheaper, crappier houses because then they go in the landfill and no one's helped by that. What we need to do, in my view, is to help the tract home builder, my colleague, the person who has a different approach to the way that we should build a house, help them to understand what they could do that would make their air tightness improve by 1% this year, and then bring them back next year and help them keep water out of the wall. And then bring them back next year and tell them how, it, you know, solar's pretty inexpensive. You could integrate this. And then all of a sudden, the people that want to get in, they could use that solar grant to maybe help with the financing. Like there's all these ways that we can work with people that build in a different way that are really going to help people and make a difference in the world. But we have to come at it together. Can I get an amen? <laughs> But that's why, like, there are some people that just rage against their code enforcement officers. And they're really, oh, oh yeah, you know, this guy's in here problem. telling me how to do it. He doesn't know how to do it. He never wore bags. What were you going to say, sir? You were, you were up there. Were you, uh, what's your name? Dan Edelman <laughs> with Rockwell. Um, just going back to Travis's roof assembly, you know, one of my thoughts would be using a water impermeable membrane on top of the roof. And now that interior vapor is not going through to that airspace that you're creating. So... The difference between and it depends on, on the pitch of the roof as well uh, but if you have impermeable layer there that's acting like doing you know anything more than an inch of a foam board being an impermeable layer so now you don't have that risk of you know the vapor going through that assembly and that's excellent that's exactly what ben told me to do he's like oh you just have to put down a peeling stick that's impermeable so it's not very often that someone gets to say, well, I'm as smart as Ben Bogey. But of course, Dan Edelman, <laughs> you are just as smart as Ben Bogey. This is fantastic. Live it up. I, it's coincidental you bring up Ben Bogey and we were talking about vapor as the biggest head scratcher in the, in, the, in the business. And he said yesterday at the round table that vapor control was easy. You know, and like, okay, I think that it's more nuanced for builders who aren't using thousands of pounds of uh, cellulose, which I suspect is a pretty effective high grade buffer. Am I right? That's correct. Um, what do you do if you're not putting in thousands of pounds of uh, cellulose insulation, Ben? So uh, the IRC lays out ratios for insulation and for vapor barriers in tables inside of the book that we can open and look at. <laughs> <laughs> and do those things to our buildings, and then we don't have issues with vapor. Yeah. We can also ventilate our buildings to make sure that we're controlling humidity loading inside of the house. We can do things like uh, not trying to vent our bathrooms using an ERV and using uh, source control. So putting bath fans uh, ideally so on dehumidity. So that's contrary to what we heard earlier today. I think it, it agree. is. And yeah. this is an opinion that I hold that flies uh, against some uh, tracks in the high performance building world. I feel that uh, source control is better than dilution. Um, so what that means is that we. Um, need to be controlling humidity and pollutants in our building where they're created. So that means in bathrooms, we need to be exhausting that directly to the outside. And we need to be doing that when we're cooking. I don't care what means, if you have gas, electric, induction for your cooking mode, whether you're frying, boiling, you baking, gotta whatever, out, right? you've got to get them out. So we have to use, uh, you know, um, vent hoods with makeup air and we can't be relying on uh you know our ventilation our, 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 our breathing air ventilation systems to be picking up those loads because those loads are higher than the rates at which that ventilation is set to accommodate inside of the building that ventilation rate is set in order to accommodate our breathing in the building and being healthy not for us you know is frying. that true that those uh standards don't account for uh you i'm know, sure they I, i'm sure they do to some degree but i uh, my own experience from other builders who have tried that approach using ERVs to vent those spaces, myself trying to use ERVs to vent bathrooms, is, is that it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work well. Mm. It works to some degree, but it doesn't work well. So, Does anyone else think there's something other than vapor control that is the head scratcher currently? I think, I think this 
the head scratchers have changed in the 20 plus years I've been doing this. Does anyone else have another thing that they find is uh, baffling to either? Go ahead. So actually baffling is kind of in the nature of this question. <laughs> um, so when we start looking at a roof design, like a cathedral ceiling versus a wall assembly, for a wall assembly, we want the rain screen on the exterior, your vent. In a roof and a ceiling, you want that it, the air to essentially go through the roof underneath the sheathing. So what's the difference there? Can you put the vent on top of the roof? We've shown that in yeah. fine yeah. building, right? Yes. Yeah. Do you think that there's any better understanding of that issue in the last few years? I think there is. Yeah. I mean, obviously publications like fine home building, I did read that article. Um, well, don't believe everything you read. <laughs> <laughs> I think your best bet is to go on Green Building Advisor and ask Martin Holiday how to vent a cathedral ceiling for the 700th and Oh my God, time. so ventilation, <laughs> woo, another thing we've been talking about. A uh, number of discussions yesterday amended ventilation. Does every house need a ERV, HRV? Uh, I, every house that I'm going to build going forward, I'm planning to put one in. So, so if uh, I put my money uh, where my uh, mouth is, yeah. An exhaust-only ventilation system is not enough? No. No? No, if you're going to build a, a, if you're going to build a proper home that's going to be insulated and comfortable to live in, you need to control your air. You don't, exhaust-only ventilation is not a means of control. It's uh, at least an unreliable one, mm -hmm. to be fair. I guess you're controlling it, but you're controlling it so loosey-goosey. You don't know where that air is coming yeah. from is what you're saying, right? Correct. And you don't know if it's the right volume. You're also wasting a lot of energy if you're bringing in the ice cold air from outside in the winter. Well, you are, right? Because no, it's coming course. from somewhere, right? Yes. Well, and if that's the thing. It's like, you know, like you say, oh, there's a certain air tightness level that you need to have mechanical ventilation. But if you're not at that air tightness level, chances are most of your air is coming through your mouse infested fiberglass bats. So. Yeah, I don't have any ERV in my own home. So as far as the practice what you preach approach, uh, I'm still working on it. Um, I've been learning a lot. I keep coming to events like this and I learn more and more every year and I try to get better. But my existing air quality in my home, I do have exhaust only ventilation and I do have a low performing wall assembly and I do have a. You're like everyone else in America, right? Yeah. 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 You know, at, at the time that I redid my siding, I was like, oh, this is going to be great. I'm going to put up a house wrap. And I talked to my lumber yard and they sold me the house wrap that they had. And it was a pin punched piece of plastic. And I missed a golden opportunity to air seal my home. And I'm glad my wife doesn't listen to the podcast because she'd be like, when do you tear on the siding? <laughs> because I heard that we need an ERV and I expect that done. And she would be quite right. She should expect that. We should all expect that. So do, are any of you using like exhaust only ventilation strategies, uh, like on a timer or either continuous? I mean, like for decades, that was uh, touted as a legitimate strategy, right, Randy? Randy Williams. Yeah, it, it, it could be. Uh, being from where I am in Minnesota, uh, Minnesota has actually had on the code books, they modify the energy code. Um, they've required balanced mechanical ventilation since right around 2000. We've been doing it for over 20 years. Um, the reason is because of our high poly use, um, but we are making houses tight, fairly tight. And they have been since I've been a builder. We The, the houses I'm testing now, lower door testing, are... 1.8, 1.5, you know, two right around there. So they're fairly tight. And that's code that's without trying. It's just the poly that's acting as the uh, good or bad. Uh, there's Poly isn't great. Uh, there's other methods so, I'd rather see. Uh, Randy, are these folks detailing interior poly vapor barriers like Canadians do with tape and uh, enclosures behind electrical boxes? So for they those are. of you who don't know, the Canadians have been doing uh, this air sealing strategy with polyethylene for decades now, and they make it airtight, and it works pretty good. It does, and that's but that's the reason we need mechanical ventilation, especially balanced mechanical ventilation. Um, it's just too tight. We're, we're going to hold the moisture, especially in the wintertime. We're going to hold that moisture in, which and is what's the horrible. what's the problem with that? Uh, well, if it's in number one, it's bad for indoor air quality. I mean, you're, you're raising not, not so much the humidity, but the, what gets stuck with the humidity. You know, if you're Mold. tight enough, yes. We want to dilute that stuff. We want to make sure that we've got some fresh air inside the house for the occupants. Um, but we, we really need to control humidity in my climate. You know, when uh, in my presentation, I, I we had uh, I gave the example that my low temperature, not too far from me, was minus 60. Is our is our state record low temperature? <laughs> 
you know, if what, you're, say that again, 60, 60 minus below. 60? 60, my, and that was 1996. I was uh, working in a construction. What is that even like? You don't want to go. That's outside. like being on Mars. <laughs> it is. It's, it's yeah. It's sharp. Very and sharp. Mars is not that cold. So. <laughs> so when you're when you get that big of a delta T, think about and the difference between the inside and outside temperature. Think about you're heating your house to 70. That's you've 130 got, degrees. It is. Is that my math right, Travis? Oh, yes, yeah, the wrong guy. Joe, okay. the numbers. <laughs> so what kind of a drive do you get at that point? What what's you know, you, you get some air that you get stack effect that wants to move. Hopefully your house is tight that you're not losing all, but it happens. You're, you're, you don't want that moisture to end up in a condensing surface. So the folks that uh, are critical of building science often say that the, the principles and the techniques are, 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 are based on very cold climates. What do you think that having a tight house or improving the efficiency of a house in a warm climate, how, how does that help? As far as being in a warm climate? Well, it's like, well, how does it help your house? Yeah, like, w w why, why should folks in warmer places than, uh, that don't get minus 60 uh, care about this, right? Um, I, again, it's just kind of the same stuff. If you're in a warm climate, you don't want that hot, humid air coming into your house. Now you've got to condition that. You've got to try to get rid of that moisture. Um, the, the indoor air quality part where you don't want to have a possum where your return air is, I think, uh, who, who, Allison, Allison Bales, Bales are you really example. Possible? Yep. Yep. We don't want to be sucking that kind of stuff. <laughs> that into was your so house. horrible for those of you who aren't aware. So he was talking about when you don't know where your, uh, ventilation air in this case, I believe it was a central AC system or a heat pump. And it had a return air system that was very leaky and it was in a crawl space with a dead possum. So of course the dead possum vapors are getting sucked into your HVAC system, right? That was the- And the, distributed the, for all to enjoy. Yeah, it goes the, the whole house. <laughs> you don't need to be in the crawl space to enjoy that. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a whole nother discussion. We can have the discussion of where the ductwork should sit. Yeah. Should, oh, yeah. You know, that, that, that's something else. But yeah, it, it, it's important both climates. Make sure that you're, you're airtight. Make sure your indoor air quality, and then get dilution, get that exchange through mechanical ventilation. This, this next question is one I can't wait to hear the answers from, I think, is... Uh, you know I'm a bad tipper, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, you all set there? You need another one? Sorry. <laughs> Brandon helped me out, but I said, you know I'm a bad tipper, right? I didn't give him a dime. Yeah, so recording the podcast while drinking beer is something I think we should do all the time from for now on. For sure. Right? I mean, Highly recommend it. We're usually sitting at home anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> so what does the construction media and the general media get wrong about home building and building science in, in, in this country. Go ahead. I'm going to have a really unpopular viewpoint on this. Uh, there's going to be a bunch of people that jump up and argue with me, but I'm ready. Uh, I think that for a long, long time, probably as long as I can remember, people have been telling me that it doesn't cost more to build better. And I've been trying really hard to build better for a really long time. And it always <laughs> costs me more and it costs more because you need uh, a better material, which costs more. You need someone who's trained. You need, exactly. you got to spend the time to train the person yeah. if there isn't somebody already there. But that better labor costs more. Joe and I have two framers on two different jobs right now. And one framer is someone who requires a ton of supervision. Daily site visits, daily corrections, daily assistance. And then we have another framer on a job who could almost run the job without our presence. I've checked in on him once in the last week and a half. I checked in on him before the symposium. It was like, everything's going exactly as it should. But we're talking about a... You should never say that, you know. Right. I've, I've jinxed it now. <laughs> that house will be in shambles yeah, when I get out of here today. On fire as we speak, right? But the point is that the, the price point is so... like That's a wide chasm. But I'm getting a much better product out of the other guy. And I'm doing it with less effort on my part. But it is costing me more. And it's worth it. So I always say when people go, oh, you know, it doesn't cost more to build better. I say it absolutely does cost more. And it's absolutely worth it. And if you start to if you start to include the conversation about the long term durability, then you can talk about it how cost it costs more. the same or less because it lasted longer. Your durability interval was increased. Your you energy bills are less. Exactly. And then you can make that argument. But so many people build their house and live there for seven years and then they're yeah, gone. I, that, I guess that is a challenge. Because one thing I, I remember seeing some articles on Green Building Advisor about how the industrial world has been 
ahead of us for decades on energy efficiency. But that's because, you know, they're spending, a, a, you know, a, a, a manufacturer spending thousands or mil millions of dollars a year on on energy, and they've got accountants that say, and over the next ten years, if we invest in this equipment, we're going to save money in the long run. And they have a lot of these equipment manufacturers and facilities, they have an R&D budget. They have people who are paid to find that efficiency and get there. I don't know any residential home builder my size that has an R&D budget. I'm not aware of any of that. I you do. On, it's called your profit. <laughs> <laughs> I rely on my industry partners, uh, my colleagues, and frankly, manufacturers to be doing that R&D yeah. and telling me, hey, we, we like, hey, we discovered the spray foam uh, on a hot roof assembly in South Carolina. If it's open cell, it can hold water and rot through your roof. I need to know that so that I don't make that mistake. What were you going to say? Uh, Who hi, are you? Uh, Jimmy Rohr uh, with Branch Pattern out of Omaha, Nebraska. Um, R&D tax credits, you should look into that. Um, so what, what I was going to say is I think that this answers two of your questions is terminology. Um, so what is the common misconception and what is... Uh, uh, what are we getting wrong? What are we getting wrong? Terminology. What are we getting wrong? Terminology? So when it comes to vapor, I cannot stand seeing class three vapor barrier. Right. It is not a barrier anymore when now it's, it's class like three. Yeah. So the, if we could all come to a consensus on whether it's a, are, are, are we, is it air, is it water, is it WRB, is it like? That's a pet peeve of mine too. I so think the, how, you know, how we're we in a technical together? industry. We got to be precise with our language, right? That's it, very important. So how, how can we expect our owners, uh, contractors, subcontractors, anybody to agree on anything if we can't even agree on the terminology, on the terminology of what we're calling it? I agree. That's an excellent point. And I would reinforce my argument that the code can help us with that because the whole first, what is it, 28 pages of Glossary. definitions are so critical yeah. to being able to use the Nobody remainder of the code. Nobody reads that part. <laughs> Damn it. Right? I don't, yeah, I mean, I guess I'm the dummy who reads the book. No, I but. mean, it's like, it's not, you, you look up the rules that you need to build the house. Hmm? I'm guessing most folks aren't spending their free time reading the, the terms at the front of the book, but you know, God bless you. Well, I, I want to back up to something you mentioned just in passing a minute ago is the industry partners. I mean, the thing is, the manufacturers of all these products that we're using are the ones who are doing the most research as, as to how they work in building assemblies. So instead of guessing, you know, on on a lot of this R&D stuff, it's like put the burden on, on them. And, and, and a lot of the companies like have engineers on staff all day long ready to, and they're excited to, to, to answer those questions for you. You know, hundred percent. The our, the discussion that I had with Ben where he tried to save me from my vapor trouble came <laughs> after I talked to Dan at Rockwell who said, yep, I've got that going to my building science team and you're going to get the full report. They'll do that for you. If you guys, if, if you're not aware of this, if you have a question about your product, you can talk to the manufacturer of that product. And if it's a really good manufacturer, they have a whole team devoted to serving you with the information that you need. I, uh, I mean, it's similar, it. it's similar to how if you go to your local building supply place, you, you, you can for free get your LVLs spec'd. And that's a service they provide because they want you to be using their product the right way. And they, they have an interest in your success. And I think any manufacturer who recognizes the importance of the relationship with their customers and... Uh, makes it an emphasis of their business model to help you do what you're trying to do is the company I want to support. 100%. And the companies that don't, you know, they don't need our money. Right? Very true. <laughs> Way to go. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> and if you're worried about b being brand neutral, I will throw it back to Mariana's company, Emu. They have, if you guys don't follow Emu Enrique, Enrico Emu, Emu at Enrico. I'm going to botch it all the way. So if you, Emu Enrico? Or Emu Building Science or Emu Mariana, Emu whatever. Any of those on Instagram. So Enrico. Well, say that again, because no, folks aren't going to hear that. Oh, oh, Mariana, what, what is your company? Yeah, come up and tell us. Because you didn't, we didn't give you a chance to introduce yourself oh, earlier okay. either. Uh, thanks. It's Emu Mariana, Emu Enrico. And our company is Emu Building Science. Um, you can find it under Emu Passive or Emu Systems. So, so we should tell folks that. Mariana teaches folks how to do passive houses, both tradespeople and designers. So if you need that training, that's where to go. Thank you. I'll say that's hydrothermal analysis. Yes, we do product certification as well and project certification and hydrothermal analysis and anything related to passive. 
<laughs> All right, folks, let's say <laughs> the drinking's not getting too far out of hand, though. The reason that I brought it up, though, is I started to think, as, as some people do, some naive folks get into, oh, I think I've started to get this. I'm starting to feel comfortable. I'm, I'm ready to build this. This is, a, this is a process or an assembly that I feel pretty good about. And you start to kind of think, oh, you know, I got this figured out. I'm doing a good job. And then you look at what Enrico's putting up in his thermal energy modeling, and he's looking at thermal energy transfer through fasteners. I'm not thinking about the damn nail. <laughs> like I'm, I'm, I'm giving myself credit for an almost R30 wall right. with my Zip R6 on the outside and my Rockwell R23 in the cavity. It's not even really effective R value. Like I haven't deducted for the studs. He's counting the damn nails, man. man. That's cool. It's next level. So it's there's science. there's people out here that are watching this so close that you can you can get the information from if you want to do better. And that's the point I was trying to make. So uh, to all of you out there, what are the most promising new building products to help us build better performing homes, longer lasting homes, more comfortable homes? And what should we be be avoiding? Go ahead, Ben. It looks like you're you're just like. And, and this this is one that um, at first I was very skeptical about um, because I thought it was a gimmick and I thought it didn't really have a place in our industry. But after a couple of years of looking at it, I think it has a really uh, broadly applicable use in our industry, and that's Aero Seal. Okay, so at first I thought anybody so that's familiar folks, with this, this is a uh, an air sealing product that is. Uh, blown into the house through a blower door. It's atomized and it it's forced out of the cracks and ultimately seals them up. And it's very effective, right, Ben? That's correct. Yeah. So under they pressurize the house and they atomize this stuff and it finds all the air leakage. And at first I thought this was a cop out. And uh, I think that was just my own ego of being somebody that obsesses over. Because you over. had done it the old fashioned way. Exactly. Right? And I thought this was a cop out. This was a cheap way to get to this level of performance and everybody needs to put in the sweat and grime and figure out how to air seal buildings. But when you start to step back and look at it is, is we can make a noticeable difference on the energy usage of our buildings and our nation if we start to broadly deploy this technology into residential buildings, even commercial buildings. And it it's, takes it's simple. hours instead of days, It right? takes one or two trained people versus yeah. an entire trained team of laborers throughout the whole project to execute it. So, Well, not only that, but I mean, no matter how thorough you are, a visual inspection of every single crack and every single surface and corner in a house is a tough way to be to do reliable air sealing. Sounds and this like is a basic lot of fun to me, man. <laughs> how and do you, so even how do you visually see air <laughs> leakage? Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else have something that they are uh, especially jazzed about? Marianne again. Uh I just think thin glass should be mentioned. What's that? Um, so Alpen Windows is doing a lot of really great introductory R&D work, and they've just pulled out a new product with thin glass involved. And, thin um, glass? Thin glass. What so, does that mean? Well, so windows are kind of the make it or break it of high performance, right? If you're right, trying to reach they're R5 and we're building R30 walls, right? And the entire world of window engineering is like a whole other rabbit hole you can go down that's completely its own thing. Alvin's been doing a lot of research with trying to make um, high performance windows more affordable, also easier logistically. So the big thing with thin glass is that it reduces the weight by a lot. Um, the interior pa pane of the triple glaze window is made up of glass similar to like what's on our cell phones, very thin pane of glass. <laughs> and that saves money? Yeah. Yeah. can. Yeah. So, I mean, it's at the beginning stages, they've just come out with the products, but, and you know, there's a lot of potential. I think that's got a lot more potential to shift the window industry. It's not talked about as much as I think it should be really. I had um, no idea it existed. So there you go. Well, Thank Alpen, you. Was, Alpen was already doing the suspended films instead of additional panes. They were doing films between the panes. So they were still creating, you know, they were trapping air yep. as the, the insulator in the glass. But the, the thin glass stuff is, is really kind of, it's really a big deal. I mean, Joe and I just did a, a, a big, beautiful house that we're excited about, but it had a lot of big European style windows that we needed to install on the second floor at a, I don't know, what is it, 46 feet? It was feet? 40 freaking feet up there. I could tell yeah. look at it. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. And as we were lifting those windows, manually I was thinking i wish these were lighter yeah. and there's someone else working on that that's what i'm saying this that's is pretty great. cool there's a lot of opportunities and there are 10. which is better than the window that i put in thank you ben he just said it's an r10 window with the thin glass for everyone that couldn't hear ben anyone else want to offer their uh, most promising product for the 
better builder? I'll I'll quick quick add to to Ben's side comment from Mariana's. Uh, In North America, there's R20 and R40 windows as well. So if we need windows, right, if we need them, that's one thing. But if we if we reduce the need for energy, then our renewables that we add to the building at some point, whoever owns or uses that building, are lessened. So one way to do that, if you ever met me before, you probably heard me say you need a good thermal break, right? We could all enjoy a good thermal break. And uh, I'm blessed that you guys are opening this conversation because the more people that hear what you all put forward, the more people want to eat more of it and share more of it. Bless your hearts. All right, so anyone have any building products they want to throw under the bus that were promised? Oh, go ahead, Randy. (laughs) (laughs) This one wasn't under the bus. Um, One thing that I see a lot of is um, not understanding the controls of the house and the HVAC systems. You know, adjusting the thermostat. You're talking like thermostats? Thermostats, one thing. That's pretty simple. You know, up or down. Ben had a great comment yesterday. Don't even put the numbers on it. Just go by comfort. You know, should it go up or down? That, that's great. But in in the ventilation end of it, especially, uh, the HRVs that I'm seeing, uh, they, they need to be adjusted. A lot of the, 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 the controls need to be adjusted based on the outside temperature. Now, how many people are going in to adjust that paying attention to the outside temperature. I, I'd like to see a great integration between a thermostat and an HRV where everything is maybe smart. <laughs> an you ideal it, interface. It, it makes it so the client doesn't have to figure it out. Exactly. Yeah. Maybe self-learning. Uh, you know, the client maybe adjusts a couple things or the, maybe the HVAC contractor helps the client adjust a few things in the beginning, gives them training on how to maintain that stuff, you know, as far as the HRV, change of furnace filter, stuff like that. But then it kind of takes care of itself. No, no more thinking by the homeowner. That's what I would like to see. I think homeowners doing less thinking is always a good thing. I agree. I would piggyback on that, that in at least in our uh, climate zone for super humid. Uh, I think we need to start seeing dedicated dehumidifiers as part of a normal mechanical package. It shouldn't be a weird upgrade. Do you think that like the new generation of variable capacity central equipment could satisfy that need? I, I it think can. it could. Yeah. yeah, it definitely can. But I also am out there selling it every day and I know what people are willing to buy. And most of my clients want a forced air system that is maybe two stage we we're we're working on selling more uh, the fd equipment and we're getting there and we're selling most of that on our high performance stuff now but i still have yet to sell a dedicated dehu and i think it makes a ton of sense like especially we were talking about yesterday the shoulder shoulder seasons are bigger in a high performance home right and that's when this uh, dedicated dehumidifier really shines, right? Is helping control the humidity when the AC is not running, right? Yeah, and you could run your AC less. This is one of those where you add money into this product and then you decrease the money spent on operating this product. And it, it, it is one of those potentially cost neutral or cost advantageous over a, a timeline that's adequate. Hmm. But well, it's a hard sell on front. And, and this kind of goes hand in hand with what Randy was saying. And because like, I know from experience, my house is by far not a high performance home, but I've got my mini splits in there running right now, cooling the place off. And as soon as the weather changed recently, all of a sudden I could just feel the humidity in my house change. So then I turn the air conditioning down to boost the dehumidification because I don't have a dedicated dehumidifier in my house. And now your house is cold. Yeah. Yeah. I have the same condition in my home. The wife's wearing a sweater. It's the middle of summer, but I got to have it down to 68 or all my fine home building pages are wavy. And I'm not having that. Can we do something about the paper? Yeah, we need better, better paper on the magazine. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So I've talked to lots of people who have stored the fine home buildings in their basement for decades. You can imagine what that smells like when they take those out of there, right? Does anyone have any final thoughts to share with our listeners before we uh, part company? Really, you guys are going to abandon your opportunity to reach tens of thousands of fine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, just, yeah, I mean, I, I, I got to say, I mean, this has just been an amazing event, and I know it never In spite never of would, this part. Well, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I know it wouldn't happen without you, Travis. So. You guys are very kind to mention me, and I do appreciate it. It would be ridiculous to mention that without Joe, my partner in Catalyst, and also in BS and Beer KC, the nonprofit that hosts this. Our uh, sponsors. Yeah. A hundred percent, we would have to mention the sponsors, but what I want, I wanted to thank the attendees, the people that take their time out of their work schedule. They're not getting paid. They're coming here. They're spending money to get better themselves. Yeah. Yeah, And it's so it's inspirational to see that. So I, I thank all of you. Thank you all. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. Thanks to Rob, Travis, and all of you for joining us. And thanks to all of you out there for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, and review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Farewell from the Midwest Building Science Symposium. Keep Craft Alive. We love you, Kansas City! (laughs) Happy building, everybody. Keep Craft Alive, and thanks again for listening.